Okay, now we're going to be reading chapter eight, The Last Night. Mr Utterson was sitting by his fireside one evening after dinner when he was surprised to receive a visit from Paul. Bless me, Paul, what brings you here, he cried. And then, taking a second look at him, what ails you, he added, is the doctor ill? Mr Utterson, said the man, there is something wrong. Take a seat and here is a glass of wine for you, said the lawyer. Now, take your time and tell me plainly what you want. You know the doctor's way, sir, replied Paul, and how he shuts himself up. Well, he's shut up again in the cabinet, and I don't like it, sir. I wish I may day if, die if I like it. Mr Utterson, sir, I'm afraid. Now, my good man, said the lawyer, be explicit. What are you afraid of? I've been afraid for about a week, returned Paul, doggedly disregarding the question, and I can bear it no more. The man's appearance amply bore out his words. His manner was altered for the worse, and except for the moment when he first announced his terror, he had not once looked in the lawyer's face. Even now, he sat with a glass of wine untasted on his knee and his eyes directed to the corner of the floor. I can bear it no more, he repeated. Come, said the lawyer. I see you have a good reason, Paul. I see there is something seriously amiss. Try to tell me what it is. I think there's been foul play, said Paul hoarsely. Foul play, cried the lawyer, a good deal frightened and rather inclined to be irritated in consequence. What foul play? What does a man mean? I don't say, sir, was the answer, but will you come along with me and see for yourself? Mr Utterson's only answer was to rise and get his hat and greatcoat, but he observed with wonder the greatness of relief that appeared upon the butler's face, and perhaps with no less that the wine was still untasted when he set it down to follow. It was a wild, cold, seasonable night in March, with a pale moon lying on her back as though the wind had tilted her, and flying rack of the most di uh, diaphanous and lawny texture. The wind was made it difficult and flecked the blood into the face. It seemed to have swept the streets, unusually bare of passengers besides, for Mr Utterson thought he had never seen that part of London so deserted. He could have wished it otherwise, never in his life had been conscious of so sharp a wish to see and touch his fellow creatures, for struggle as he might, there was born in, upon his mind a crushing anticipation of calamity. The square, when they got there, was full of wind and dust, and the thin trees in the garden were lashing themselves along the railing. Paul, who kept all the way a pace or two ahead, now pulled up in the middle of the pavement, and in spite of the biting weather, took off his hat and mopped his brow with a red pocket handkerchief. But for all the hurry of his coming, these were not the dews of exertion that he wiped away, but the moisture of some strangling anguish, for his face was white and his voice, when he spoke, harsh and broken. Well, sir, he said, here we are, and God grant there be nothing wrong. Amen, Paul, said the lawyer. Thereupon the servant knocked on a very guarded manner. The door was opened on the chain and a voice asked from within, Is that you, Paul? It's all right, said Paul. Open the door. The hall, when they entered it, was brightly lighted up. The fire was built high and about the hearth, the whole of the servants, men and women, stood huddled together like a flock of sheep. At the sight of Mr Utterson, the housemaid broke into hysterical whimpering and the cook, crying out, God bless him, it's Mr Utterson, ran forward as if to take him in her arms. What, what, are you all here? The lawyer said the lawyer peevishly. Very irregular, very unseemly. Your master would be far from pleased. They're all afraid, said Poole. Blank silence followed, no one protesting. Only the maid lifted her voice and now wept loudly. Hold your tongue. Paul said to her with a ferocity of accent that testified to his own jangled nerves and indeed when the girl had so suddenly raised the note of her lamentation they all star started and turned towards the inner door with faces of dreadful expectation. And now, continued the butler, addressing the knife boy, reach me a candle and we'll get this through han hands at once. And then he begged Mr Utterson to follow him and led the way to the back garden. Now, sir, said he, you come as gently as you can. I want you to hear, and I don't want you to be heard. And see here, sir, if by a chance he is to ask you in, don't go. Mr Utterson's nerves at this unlooked-for termination gave a jerk that nearly threw him from his balance. 
but he recollected his courage and followed the butler into the laboratory building through the surgical theatre, with its lumber of crates and bottles, to the foot of the stair. Here Poole motioned him to stand on one side and listen, while he himself, setting down the candle and making a great and obvious call on his resolution, mounted the steps and knocked with a somewhat uncertain hand on the red baize of the cabinet door. Mr Utterson, sir, asking to see you, he called, and even as he did so, once more violently signed to the lawyer to give ear. A voice answered from within. Tell him I cannot see anyone, it said complainingly. Thank you, sir, said Paul, with a note of something like triumph in his voice, and taking up his candle, he led Utterson back across the yard and into the great kitchen, where the fire was out and the beetles were leaping on the floor. Sir, he said, looking into Utterson's eyes, was that my master's voice? It seems much changed, replied the lawyer, very pale, but giving look for look. Changed? Well, yes, I think so, said the butler. Have I been twenty years in this man's house to be deceived about his voice? No, sir. Master's made away with. He's made away with eight days ago when we heard him cry out upon the name of God and who's in there instead of him and why it stays there is a thing that cries to heaven, Mr Utterson. This is a very strange tale, Paul. This is a rather wired tale, my man, said Mr Utterson, biting his finger. Suppose it were as you suppose. Supposing Dr Jekyll to have been, well, murdered. What could induce a murderer to stay? That won't hold water. It doesn't condemn itself to reason. Well, Mr Utterson, you're a hard man to satisfy, but I'll do it yet, said Paul. All this last week, you must know him, or it, whatever it is that lives in that cabinet, has been crying night and day for some sort of medicine and cannot get it to his mind. It was sometimes his way, the master's that is, to write his orders on a sheet of paper and throw it down the stair. We've had nothing else this week back, nothing but papers and a closed door and the very meals left there to be smuggled in when nobody's looking. Well, sir, every day I, and twice and thrice in the same day, there have been orders and complaints and I've been sent flying to all the wholesale chemists in town. Every time I brought the stuff back, There'll be another paper telling me to return it because it was not pure and another order to, to a different firm. This drug is wanted bitter bad, sir, whatever for. Have you any of these papers? asked Dr. Utterson. Paul felt in his pocket and handed out a crumpled note, which the lawyer, bending nearer to the candle, carefully examined. Its contents ran thus. Dr. Jekyll presents his compliments to Mrs. Moore he assures him that the last sample is impure and quite useless for his present purpose. In the year 18 blank, Dr J purchased a somewhat large quantity from Mrs M. He now begs them to search their most sedulous care and should any of the same quality be left, forward it to him at once. Expense is no consideration. The importance, the importance of this to Dr J can hardly be exaggerated. So far the letter had run composedly enough but here, with a sudden splutter of the pen, the writer's emotion had broken loose. For God's sake, he added, find me some of the old. This is a strange note, said Mr Utterson, and then sharply. How do you come to have it open? The man at Moore's was a main angry, sir, and he threw it back at me like so much dirt, returned Paul. This is unquestionably the doctor's hand, you do you know, resumed the lawyer. I thought it looked like it, said the ser servant rather sulkily, and then he, with another voice, but what matters hand of right, he said, I've seen him. Seen him, repeated Utterson. Well, that's it, said Paul. It was this way. I came suddenly into the theatre from the garden. It seems he had slipped out to look for this drug or whatever it is, for the cabinet door was open, and there he was at the far end of the room, digging among the crates. I looked up when I came in, he gave a cry, and whipped upstairs into the cabinet. It was but for one minute that I saw him, but the hair stood on my head like quills, sir. If, it was, if that was my master, why, he had a mask upon his face. If that was my master, why did he cry out like a rat and run from me? I've served him long enough, and then... The man paused and passed his hand over his face. These are all very strange circumstances, said Dustin, but I think I begin to see daylight... Your master, Paul, is plainly seized with one of the maladies that both torture 
and deform the sufferer. Hence, for aught I know, the alteration of his voice, hence the mask and the avoidance of his friends, hence his eagerness to find the drug by means of which the poor soul retains some hope of ultimate recovery, God grant that he may not be deceived. There is my explanation. It is sad enough, Paul, aye, and appalling to consider, but it is plain and natural, hangs well together, and delivers us from all exorbitant alarms. I'm just going to pause here then and just explain this last paragraph. So Mr Utterson is explaining this strange behaviour that Paul has observed and said that it seems that really it's just a simply a case that Dr Jekyll is suffering from some awful illness and, and therefore is kind of covering his face and acting in this very strange way. But Paul is very confused because although the man writes with the hand of Dr Jekyll, he doesn't seem to look like him and he doesn't sound like him. And therefore, he is very confused. Sir, said the butler, turning to a sort of mottled pallor, that thing was not my master, and there's the truth. My master, here he looked round him and began to whisper, is a tall, fine build of a man, and this was more of a dwarf. Utterson attempted to protest. Oh, sir, cried Paul, do you think I do not know my master after twenty years? Do you think I do not know where his head comes into the cabinet door, where I saw him every morning of my life? No, sir, that thing in the mask was never Dr Jekyll. God knows what it was, but it was never Dr Jekyll. And it is the belief of my heart that there was murder done. Paul, replied the lawyer, if you say that, it will become my duty to make it certain. Much as I desire to spare your master's feelings, much as I am puzzled by this note which seems to prove him to still be alive, I shall consider it my duty to break in that door. Ah, oh, Mr Utterson, that's talking, cried the butler. And now comes the second question, resumed Utterson. Who is going to do it? Why, you and me, sir, was the undaunted reply. That's very well said, returned the lawyer, and whatever comes of it, I shall make it my business to see you are no loser. There's an axe in the theatre, continued Paul, and you might take the kitchen poker for yourself. The lawyer took that rude but rating instrument into his hand and balanced it. Do you know, Paul, he said, looking up, that you and I are about to place ourselves in a position of some peril. You may say, sir, indeed, returned the butler. It is well, then, that we should be frank, said the other. We both think more than we have said. Let us make clean breast. This masked figure that you saw, did you recognise it? Well, sir, it went so quick, and the creature was doubled up that I could hardly swear to that, was the answer. But if you mean, was it Mr Hyde? Well, yes, I think it was. You see, it was much of the same bigness, and it had the same quick, light way with it. And then, who else could have got in by the laboratory door? You have not forgot, sir, that there was a time in the murder that he still had a key with him. But that's not all. I don't know, Mr Utterson, if you've ever met Mr Hyde. Yes, said the lawyer. I once spoke with him. Then you must know as well that the rest of us, that there is something queer about that gentleman, something that gave a man a turn. I don't know rightly how to say it, sir, beyond this that you felt in your marrow, kind of cold and thin. I own I felt something of what you describe, said Mr Utterson. Quite so, sir, returned Paul. Well, when that masked thing was like a monkey jumped down from among the chemicals and whipped into the cabinet, it went down my spine like ice. Oh, I know it's not evidence, Mr Utterson. I'm book learned enough for that. But a man has his feelings and I give you my Bible word it was Mr Hyde. Aye, aye, said the lawyer. My fears inclined to the same point. Evil, I fear, founded. Evil was come to, sure to come of that connection. I truly, I believe you, I believe poor Harry is killed and I believe his murderer, for what purpose God alone can tell, is still lurking in his victim's room. Well, let our name be Vengeance. Call Bradshaw. The footman came at the summons, very white and nervous. Pull yourself together, Bradshaw, said the lawyer. This suspense, I know, is telling upon all of you. But it is now our intention to make an end of it. Paul here and I are going to force our way into the cabinet. If all is well, my shoulders are broad enough to bear the blame. Meanwhile, lest anything should really be amiss or any malefactor seek to escape by the back, you and the boy must go around the corner with a pair of good sticks and take your post at the laboratory door. We give you ten minutes to get to your stations. As Bradshaw left, the lawyer looked at his watch. And now, Paul, let's, let us get to ours, he said.
and taking the poker under his arm, led the way into the yard. The scud had banked over the moon, and it was now quite dark. The wind, which only broke in puffs and draughts, came into the deep well of the building, tossed the light of the candle to and fro about their steps, until they came into the shelter of the theatre, where they sat down silently to wait. London hummed solemnly all around, but nearer at hand, the stillness was only broken by the sounds of a footfall moving to and fro along the cabinet floor. So it will walk all day, sir, whispered Paul, I in the better part of the night. Only when a new sample comes from the chemist, that's when there's a bit of a break. Ah, oh, it's the ill conscience that's such an enemy to rest. Ah, oh, sir, there's blood foully shed in every step of it. But hark again, a little closer. Put your heart to your ears, Mr Sutton, and tell me, is that the doctor's foot? The steps fell lightly and oddly, with a certain swing, for they always all went so slowly. It was different indeed from the heavy creaking tread of Henry Jekyll. Utterson sighed. Is there never anything else, he asked. Paul nodded. Once, he said. Once I heard it weeping. Weeping? How that? said the lawyer, conscious of a sudden chill of horror. Weeping like a woman or a lost soul, said the butler. It came away with that upon my heart and I could have wept too. But now the ten minutes drew to an end. Paul disinterred the axe from under a stack of packing straw. The candle was set upon the nearest table to light them to attack, and they drew near with bated breath to where the patient foot was still going up and down, up and down, in the quiet of the night. Jekyll, cried Utterson with a loud voice, I demand to see you. He paused for a moment, but there came no reply. I give you fair warning, our suspicions are aroused and I must and shall see you, he resumed, if not by fair means, then by foul, if not by your consent, then by brute force. Utterson, said the voice, for God's sake have mercy. Ah, that's not Jekyll's voice, it's Hyde's, cried Utterson. Down with the door, Poole. Poole swung the axe over his shoulder, the blow shook the building and the red baize door leapt against the lock and hinges. A dismal screech, as of a mere animal terror, rang from the cabinet. Up went the axe again, and again the panels crashed and the frame bounded. Four times the blow fell, but the wood was tough and the fittings were of excellent workmanship, and it was not until the fifth that the lock burst and the wreck of the door fell inwards on the carpet. The besiegers, appalled by their own riot and the stillness that had succeeded, stood back a little and peered in. There lay the cabinet before their eyes in the quiet lamplight, a good fire glowing and chattering on the hearth, the kettle singing its thin strain, a drawer or two open, papers neatly set forth on the business table, and near the fire the things laid out for tea. The quietest room, you would have said, but for the glazed presses full of chemicals, the most commonplace that night in London. Right in the middle there lay the body of a man, sorely contorted, and still twitching. They drew near on tiptoe, turned it on its back, and beheld the face of Edward Hyde. He was dressed in clothes far too large for him, clothes with the doctor's bigness. The cords of his face still moved with the semblance of life, but the life was quite gone, and by the crushed file in his hand, and the strong smell of kernels that hung upon the air, Utterson knew that he was looking on the body of a self-destroyer. We have come too late, he said sternly, whether to save or punish, Hyde is gone to his account, and it only remains for us to find the body of your master. The far greater proportion of the building was occupied by the theatre, which filled almost the whole ground story, and was lighted from above, and by the cabinet, which formed an upper story at one end, and looked upon the court. A corridor joined the theatre to the door on the by street, and with this the cabinet communicated separately by a second flight of stairs. There were besides a few dark closets and a spacious cellar. All these they now thoroughly examined. Each closet needed, be, needed but a glance, for all were empty, and all by the dust that fell from their doors had stood long unopened. The cellar indeed was filled with crazy lumber, mostly dated from the times of the surgeon, who was a Jekyll's predecessor, 
but even as they opened the door they were advertised of the uselessness of a further search by the fall of a perfect mat of cobweb, which had for years sealed up the entrance. Nowhere was there any trace of Henry Jekyll dead or alive. Paul stamped on the flags of the corridor. He must be buried here, he said, hearkening on the sound. Or he may have fled, said Utterson, and he turned to examine the door by the by street. It was locked, and lying near on, by on the flags they found the key already stained with rust. It does not look like use, observed the lawyer. Use, echoed Paul. Do you not see, sir, it is broken, much as if a man is stamped on, on it. Aye, continued Utterson, and the fractures too are rusty. The two men looked on each other with scare. This is beyond me, Paul, said the lawyer. Let's, let us go back to the cabinet. They mounted the stair in silence, and still with the occasional awestruck glance of the dead body, proceeded more thoroughly to examine the contents of the cabinet. At one table there were traces of chemical work, various measured heaps of some white salt being laid on glass saucers, as though for an experiment in which the unhappy man had been prevented. That is the same jug that I was always bringing him, said Paul, and even as he spoke the kettle was startling noise boiled over. This brought them to the fireside where the easy chair was drawn cosily up and the tea thing stood ready to the sitter's elbow, the very sugar in the cup. There were, ve- or, there were several books on the shelf. One lay beside the tea things open and Utterson was amazed to find it a copy of a pious work for which Jekyll had several times expressed a great esteem annotated in his own hand with startling blasphemies. Next, in the course of their review of the chamber, the searchers came to the shovel glass, into whose depths they looked with an involuntary horror. But it was so turned as to show them nothing but the rosy glow playing on the roof, the fire sparkling in a hundred repetitions along the glazed front of the presses, and their own pale and fearful countenances stooping to look in. This glass has seen some strange things, sir, whispered Paul. And surely none stranger than itself, echoed the lawyer in the same tones, for what did Jekyll, he caught himself up in the word with a start, and then conquering the weakness, what could Jekyll want with it, he said. You may say that, said Paul. Next they turned to the business table. On the desk, among the neat array of papers, a large envelope was uppermost and bore in the doctor's hand the name of Mr Utterson. The lawyer unsealed it and several enclosures fell to the floor. The first was a will, drawn in the same eccentric ter- terms as the one he had returned six months before, to serve as a testament in case of a death and at, as a deed of gift in case of disappearance. But in place of the name of Edward Hyde, the lawyer, with indescribable amazement, read the name of Gabriel John Utterson. He looked at Paul, then back at the paper, and last of all at the dead malefactor stretched on the carpet. My head goes round, he says. Has he been all these days in possession? He had no cause to like me. He must have raged to see me displaced, and he has not yet he has not destroyed this document. He caught up the next paper. It was a brief note in the doctor's hand and dated at the top. Oh, Paul, the lawyer cried. He was alive and here this day. He cannot have been disposed of in so short a space. He must still be alive. He must have fled. Why then... Why fled? And how? And in that case, can we venture to declare this suicide? Oh, we must be careful. I foresee that we may yet involve your master in some dire catastrophe. Why don't you read it, sir? asked Paul. Because I fear, replied the lawyer solemnly. God grant I have no cause for it. And with that, he brought the paper to his eyes and read as follows. My dear Utterson, when this shall fall into your hands... I shall have disappeared, under what circumstances I have not the penetration to foresee, but my instinct and all the circumstances of my nameless situation tell me that the end is surely and must be early. Go then and first read the narrative which Lanyon warned me he was to place in your hands, and if you care to hear more, turn to the confession of your unworthy and unhappy friend, Henry Jekyll. There is a third enclosure, asked Utterson. Here, sir, said Paul, and gave it to his hands a considerable packet sealed in several places. The lawyer put it in his pocket. I would say nothing of this paper. If your master has fled or is dead, we may at least save his credit. It is now ten. I must go home and read these documents in quiet, and I shall be back before midnight. 
when we shall send for the police. They went out, locking the door of the theatre behind them, and Utterson, once more, leaving the servants gathered about the fire in the hall, trudged back to his office to read the two narratives in which this mystery was now to be explained. <laughs>